Hi folks, this is uh, Jason. Uh, we're looking at the minimal facts approach of the resurrection and uh, I'm going to be sharing with you the main arguments uh, for the minimal fact approach and I uh, hope this is going to be a blessing to you. So let's come before the Lord. Lord, we thank you for this day. And for your love and your grace, we give you the praise and the glory and the honor. And we thank you for all your blessings and all your care and all your grace. And so, God, we praise you today. We worship you. We give you the glory. And we give you the honor. And we acknowledge that you are our God. And we give you the praise and the glory today. So, Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love. And we pray that you be with us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Uh, we'll look at um, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15. One Corinthians uh, chapter fifteen, and we read the first ten verses. Now let me remind you, uh, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. You welcomed it then and still do now, for your faith is built on this wonderful message. And it is this good if you firmly believe it, unless of course you believe something that was never true in the first place. I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me that Christ died for our sins just as the scripture says he was buried he was raised from the dead on the third day as the scripture said he was seen by Peter and then by the twelve apostles and that he was seen by more than 500 of the followers at one time most of whom are still alive though some have died by now then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles last of all I saw him too long after the others as though I had been born at the wrong time for I am the least of all the apostles and last of all I saw him too after the others as though I'd been born out of the wrong time for I am the least of all the apostles and I am not worthy to be called an apostle after the way but whatever I am now it is all because God poured out his special favor on me so that's um, the passage that we're going to be looking at um, in the defense of the resurrection um, we have to ask one of the first important things that we have to ask is can we use the documents of the New Testament uh, as an argument concerning the resurrection of Christ now it's important to realize that we can use the New Testament you don't have to believe the Bible is the Word of God to believe that the New Testament can be a source of historical information and so you will find that historians even secular historians will look at various texts of the Bible uh, in the New Testament uh, critics will grant you a certain number of Paul's epistles as genuine Paul uh, critics will grant you that there are aspects of the Gospels that they regard as historically accurate. Now they might not agree with all the Gospels, they might not agree with the entirety of the Gospels, but the point is this, is that historians do use the New Testament as part of their historical inquiry. Now what we need to do in the defense of the Christian faith concerning the resurrection is have a hypothesis of an idea of as to what of what we are stating and that hypothesis needs to uh, explain the data that would investigate it 
as we have a and we see whether there is data that confirms or disproves it um, from a historical point of view um, what we're trying to do is when we've had the hypothesis when we check it we see if after we've checked it whether again the facts substantiate what we have what what idea we have so first of all we look at the evidence that is um, in the topic we look at the evidence about the resurrection and then we say well what would be the best explanation for that evidence and then we determine various ideas that might fit that data and then we choose the best understanding of that data and that is the minimal fact approach C. Uh, Bahan McClough, M C K uh, M C C U L A A G H, in his book Justifying Historical Descriptions, gives us uh, a number of criteria to work on in our historical investigation. Number one, the hypothesis, together with other true statements, must imply further statements describing present observable data. The hypothesis must have greater explanatory scope, that is, Im imply a greater variety of observable data than rival hypotheses. Three, the hypothesis must have greater explanatory power, that is, make the observable data more probable than rival hypotheses. Four, the hypothesis must be more plausible, that is, be implied by a greater variety of accepted truths and its negative implied by fewer accepted truths than rival hypotheses. Five, the hypothesis must be a lead has hot, uh, that is include fewer new suppositions about the past not already implied by existing knowledge than rival hypotheses. Six, the hypothesis must be disconfirmed by fewer accepted beliefs, that is when conjoined with accepted truths imply fewer false statements than rival hypotheses. And seven, the hypothesis must be ex must so exceed its rivals in fulfilling conditions. Uh, two to six, that there is little chance of a rival hypothesis after further investigation, exceeding it in meeting these conditions. So, if your hypothesis explains a wide variety of data uh, better than any other hypothesis, then yours is the most likely position to be true and it has to be said that when we're dealing with historical knowledge and historical knowledge is not the same as mathematical knowledge uh, that's important because you get some apologies from the atheist and Christian side who will try and use the Bayes theorem which is like a mathematical formula but we can't have certainty in historical knowledge we work on probability, trying to understand the best set of data uh, for the best hypotheses. So, in our historical inquiry, we're looking for whether our facts, whether sorry, whether our hypothesis has the facts for explanatory scope, explanatory power, plausibility, less ad hoc compatibility with known beliefs and that it can outstrip other rival explanations now there are in this hypothesis that Christ rose from the dead we have 12 facts that that are on the table before we even begin um, and we'll look at those facts in a minute. Now, we can know whether Christianity is true or not because it can be falsified. 
Christianity hangs on 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the idea that Christ rose from the dead. All we have to do to prove that Christianity is not true is to provide the evidence to show that Jesus didn't rise from the dead. So Christianity is falsifiable. If the Christian faith can be, if evidence can be given against it to prove that it hasn't, Jesus hasn't risen, then that evidence can be provided. But if it's true, if Christianity, if Christ did rise from the dead, then evidence should be able to be provided to counteract those who would argue against it. But either way, it can either be proved or disproved. There is a criteria of uh, falsifiability in the whole application. Now, in a debate with Anthony Flew, Gary Habermas stated as to the what most scholars would agree, and Anthony Flew, an atheist at the time, agreed with these 12 facts. Fact number one, Jesus died due to the rigors of crucifixion. Fact two, Jesus was buried. Now I'll just unpack, he died to the rigors of crucifixion. Well, uh, Tacitus and Josephus verify that he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. Jesus was buried, uh, the Gospels, linked to that. Uh, his disciples, number three, doubted and despaired because Jesus' death challenged their hopes. And the Gospels and the Book of Acts point to that. Number four, the tomb in which Jesus had been buried was discovered to be empty just a few days later. Five, the disciples had real experiences that they believed were actual appearances of the risen Jesus. Six, the disciples were willing to die for the truth of these events. Seven, this gospel message was the very center for preaching the early church. Eight, the gospel uh, was proclaimed in Jerusalem, a city where Jesus had died. Nine, the Christian church was firmly, um, firmly set forth by the disciples. Um, Ten, the day of worship was Sunday. Eleven, James the skeptic became a follower of Jesus. And twelve, Paul the persecutor became a follower of Jesus. Now there are a number of uh, arguments against the resurrection. And um, The arguments against the resurrection, some of the arguments can go like things. The tomb was not known by the apostles, but that doesn't take into account the facts of 4 and 12. Maybe the woman came to the wrong tomb doesn't take into con uh, consideration facts 5 and 12. Some may say it was, a re uh, it was a legend, but this doesn't take into consideration all the facts from 1 to 12. And just uh, an aside there, I've checked uh, the history of Mithraism from 500 BC to uh, 600 AD, and uh, it's it's uh, interesting to note there's very little documentation about these religious uh, beliefs that skeptics say was part of forming Christianity. Uh, Jesus could have had a twin, but that would would not match with the facts four and eleven. What about people hallucinating? How does that account for facts five, eleven, and twelve? You have a variety of uh, experiences. You have individual appearances to of Jesus to people and mass appearances uh, a variety of phenomena that's not normally associated with hallucination and also if it was an, 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 any uh, hallucination then 
what is interesting there is it would that idea would not accord with the uh, Jewish concepts of resurrection. Um, they they knew the difference between a ghost and an illusion, an illusion and a physical resurrection. The uh, idea that if Jesus was a spiritual resurrection, it wasn't literally physical, uh, doesn't match facts 4, 5, 11, 12, and uh, is based on bad Greek semantics. Some might say that the resurrection body was stolen. This doesn't explain facts. Some might say that the body was stolen, hit by the authorities, but this doesn't explain facts 5 and 12. The idea that Jesus just died a little bit, kind of like fainted, um, but this discount doesn't fit with the facts 1 and 6. Some might say there was a plot and this was all uh, a conspiracy doesn't explain facts 5, 6, 11 and 12 um, one idea where it, all the facts fit is Jesus was an alien <laughs> you could have that as a webitar If you read uh, Gary Habermas and J.P. Moreland, page 127-128, Beyond Death, uh, basically the resurrection is based on the disciples, their experience. This experience is based on eyewitness material. This eyewitness material is difficult to explain away on naturalistic assumptions. These various experiences of eyewitness material were reported earlier, um, making a, a very strong claim that that there was historical continuity that in the story that it, it wasn't just like made up and developed and rehashed by various editors and various groups but there was already early at the beginning of Christianity a, a consistent story of the resurrection of Christ also these people's lives changed There was a notable difference in their behaviour. James, who the Lord's brother, was converted and became a martyr thrown uh, from the top of a synth, the temple. You know, he was a man who gave his life for the gospel. The facts that we have support the empty tomb. Um, you can't deny that the resurrection was at the heart of the early church teaching. It was the main teaching, central teaching. If it was central and it was the main claim, they would have thoroughly made sure what they were saying was correct. And what is most devastating and all against all the critics is that this clear teaching that they had about Christianity they preached it about his resurrection in Jerusalem. That would be the last place you would preach it. Interesting to note, the enemies of Jesus, such as the Jewish hierarchy of the time, were not able to present any evidence to overturn the resurrection. 
the fact that we see the church, how did Judaism develop into the church? What was the mechanism for that happening? That itself needs an explanation that the skeptics failed to give. Then the church changing from worship of Saturday on to a Sunday. How did this happen? Something uh, shattering and momentous must have happened for Jews to do this. We see also that important things such as James, the brother of Jesus, a skeptic, became a Christian, followed Jesus. Paul, a blasphemer, became a Christian and trusted Jesus. As we look at these various evidences, we see that skeptical ideas do not explain the data. So the historicity or the historical veracity of the resurrection of Christ. And it's interesting to note that many scholars recognize the power of the minimal fact approach. Um, William Wand, uh, Oxford University church historian says all the strictly historical evidence we have is in favour of it and those scholars who reject it ought to recognise that they do so on some other grounds than that of scientific history. Now one of the more powerful objections to the resurrection is Hume's uh, contention. And that contention is very simple. Uh, he would say that Basically, uh, miracles don't happen because nature just doesn't uh, uh, do that. We see a uniformity in the nature and uh, we just don't see miracles happening. But David Hume developed a criteria to investigate miracles. There was a miracles claim, miracle claims during the um, French Catholics uh, in the time of Pascal. And these miracle claims um, Hume decided to go and look back in history and investigate them. He had a set of about five or six criteria and when he used the criteria on these miracles he said that he had to admit that they'd taken place. And then he realized that well he had a more scientific explanation of miracles. So even though the historical evidence shows that miracles took place at the time of Pascal um, and David Hume recognizing the power of this argument um, then goes and denies it on the grounds not of evidence but on the nature of science and, and contingency. I think that if you go to the quantum level uh, in physics you will find that things are much more complex and nuanced than we really thought. And so therefore to be dogmatic and say miracles have not happened when something in, at the quantum level could come into as this existence or work with nature to change a situation is a possibility. It should be an open possibility to study the interjection of our way of thinking um, so Hume is pretty easy to debunk by using Hume really. So he denies miracles not based on evidence but based on presupposition. So that's the minimal fact approach to the resurrection and uh, I'll be doing another video um, on another subject in a second. Thank you for listening and God bless.